All right. Our scripture reading this morning uh, is a story. And I love these stories because Jesus spoke in parables many times. And uh, what we're going to hear through the message this morning is Jesus taking on Old Testament and New Testament law, right, and actually addressing a Pharisee that was a lawyer of the time. And so we are blessed this morning to have Gideon read our scripture. Please listen as we hear the word of God. Praise the Lord, everybody. God bless you all for being here. And the word said, he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and as your neighbor, as yourself. And he, and Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him, beat him, and leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed him on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers, said the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What do you see when you look into the face of your neighbor? Do you see a stranger, a friend, a foreigner, or a refugee? Do you see someone to avoid, someone to hide from? Do you see someone to hate? or someone to love? Can you see yourself in their face? Do you see the face of Jesus? Amen. Do you see the face of Jesus? So if I ask you, what is the second greatest commandment? What's the second greatest commandment? Love thy neighbor. We heard it this morning. Love thy neighbor. And I want to take you back a couple of weeks and, and catch you up and tell you how we kind of landed on the whole love thy neighbor thing because uh, it's the second greatest commandment in our very lives and eternal lives depend on it. So we finished a series called Cadence, 
And it was a four-week series, and, and Cadence was all about God's cadence, God's rhythm, the groove that God had, right? The yin and the yang, the one that created everything, all that is, all that was, and all that shall be. And so we looked at Cadence, and we, and we broke it up into several different pieces, and we, and we said, okay, well, first God created the universe, and he created the stars and the moon, and he, and he pulled out day and night, and all of a sudden we have this cadence, right? Sun up and sun down, and he creates all this stuff, and then he sticks us in it. He put you in it. And he said, this is very good, and you've got to operate within this cadence of community because there's a lot of animals and plants and fish and, and living, breathing beings here, and so you have to operate in that community. And then Cadence went on to say, we dove into it and said, well, we all have a biological cadence, right? Sometimes our, our uh, bodies disperse uh, melatonin so we can go to sleep, and then they stop dispersing that, and we all wake up, and we're all kind of on this similar cadence, right? So he creates the cadence of the universe, the cadence of, of mankind, and he says, oh, yeah, and you've got to live in community there as well. And we ended up saying, well, how do we live in community? Because one Christian is no Christian. Community, community, community. And then 4th of July hit. Yay, who's here for the 4th of July? And the kids running around with the flags. And man, that was a great celebration. I was so excited. And we talked about true independence. How are we truly independent? And our conclusion was it's dependence on God. And as God dictates, we should live in community. In other words, the entire narrative of the Bible, where's my mic? The entire narrative of the Bible, you ready to hear the whole Bible, all of those words, Old Testament, New Testament, the covenants, everything that's in the Bible, here we go, get ready for the mic drop. Uh, love thy neighbor. I'm done. That's it, have a great day. Really? And as a matter of fact, the whole message of the, the Bible is that, and we have reiterated that over and over again in our world. Let's have a look at big screens. a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you, so Let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine, could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please, won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor, a neighbor? You know what these are? <laughs> Yeah, that's it. So why for so many years, who loves seeing that, right? I saw it, I know, I know, and even like Tom Hanks did a movie about him, right? Um, by the way, do you know he was an ordained Presbyterian minister? Um, just interesting little tidbit. But why for so many years did mankind, do, do humans love the idea of having a good neighbor? Yeah. Well, because it's, it's woven right into our DNA. And so as Gideon mentioned this morning, the Jewish leaders challenge Jesus on this. They tried to uh, trip Jesus up 
by asking him about neighbors. And you know, it was a simple question that came from a rabbi, that came from a lawyer of the time. And the question was, how do I inherit eternal life? You know, just the biggest question of all of history, of all of mankind, just the question that every single person wants to know. How do we do this? And so Jesus says, well, what's written in the law, right? Old Testament. And the Jews memorized the Old Testament, the Torah. Good question. And so the religious leader, the lawyer, quotes from Deuteronomy, which is the book of the law, and from Leviticus. And he says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, well, yeah, you answered that one good. Nice job, good job memorizing that. Do this and you will live forever. And then Jesus challenges him. He says, hey, by the way, uh, are you a neighbor? And of course, the, the Pharisee is not having any of this, and especially a, a highly respected lawyer is not having any of that, right? And wanting to justify himself before Christ, he says, ha, oh yeah, so who is my neighbor? Good question. Luke 10, 25 through 29. And this sets off Jesus on one of the most well-known sermons ever preached, the Good Samaritan. How many people have said, hey, are you a Good Samaritan in your life at one time or another? And how many people say that and they don't even know that it comes from the Bible? The Good Samaritan. So here's my question to you. Are you a good neighbor? And how would you know the answer to that if you don't know who your neighbor is? Seems like a pretty profound topic. In fact, our very lives depend on it. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this worship service. We pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts is pleasing to you, O Father, our rock and our redeemer. We pray that all of your messages here, whether spoken or unspoken, are experienced by everyone. And we lift this up in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's children say, amen. I couldn't hear you online. I thought to tell you uh, about a story of, of my childhood. So when we were 11, we left New Jersey and we moved to Colorado. Uh, we lived about 25 miles outside of Denver. My family is still there. And for an 11-year-old boy, that is absolutely devastating. I mean, 11 years, my entire life, I have developed these friends and these loved ones, and my whole world was shattered. I mean, I was 11. <laughs> and we move into this new house with a new community, new friends, new school, new church, absolutely everything was new. And we didn't know anyone, I mean absolutely no one. My dad took a, a new job. No one was worried about us, no one cared about us where we were moving. In fact, we were probably the most undeserving family because no one knew anything about us. Why would anyone care? And as we start unpacking, you know, we have this big semi pull up and as we're, we're unpacking and everything's going on and the movers are coming in, pretty soon we get this knock at the door. And it was Mrs. O'Hara. Yeah, Mrs. O'Hara. She lived behind us. And Mrs. O'Hara had a plate of cookies. Hi, honey, welcome to the community. And then right behind her a couple hours later, Mrs. Davis, and she came over with sandwiches. And you're like, you gotta be kidding me, we're gonna love this place. It was awesome. I mean, they just wanted to make us feel welcome. They knew nothing about us. We were totally undeserving. And then I started making friends with their kids, of course, right? And, and they had to overlook a lot of crazy things because as I mentioned, we were from New Jersey. What? What do you got? Huh? 
Don't make me pull the Jersey attitude on you because I will. And we're in Colorado. <laughs> they have a different attitude from New Jersey in Colorado. Trust me. But I thought at 11 years old, because I knew everything, that if I'm moving to Colorado, I'm going to wear a cowboy hat everywhere. So I did. And I wore the belt buckle. And instead of beating me up, they, my buddies overlooked it. I'm like, all right, he's, I'll let that one go. We also moved there with a Siberian Husky. We had this giant Siberian Husky, little, little um, deviation from what most people had in Colorado in this community that we moved into. Oh, and one of the coolest thing was, see, in New Jersey, we had a pool in our backyard. Yeah, so I spent a lot of time in the pool in the backyard, but when we moved to Colorado, no pool in the backyard, we had a community pool. And so I figured in order to show off to everyone, because I was a good swimmer and I was fast, oh yeah, I wore my Speedo. Oh yeah, making friends all over the place. I think I even wore a little medal I had from there, a swim team there. Yeah, man. I mean, they overlooked stuff. We were undeserving. When you look at people, how do you look at them? How do you look at your neighbors? Are you like the, the priest and the, and the Levites? Too busy to get involved. I got a lot of stuff I gotta do. Or are you maybe too clean to get dirty? I can't go out, who are those people out there? Who's, is that my neighbor? Uh, too clean to get dirty. Too preoccupied to alter your schedule to enter into someone's life. Too stingy to give them a buck. Too careful to risk your own emotions, your own feelings, your own personal security. How do you look at your neighbor. Are you a neighbor? So who's your neighbor? And in thinking about this message, I thought, you know, I came up with a whole list. I'm like, how am I going to get through this whole list? They're going to have to endure an hour and a half message. So this will only be like three and a half hours long. I'm kidding online. We'll be done soon. Stay there. <laughs> Take some coffee. So there's several things about neighbors that we have to know. And one of the things is that they are undeserving. In Luke 10, 30, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, we have to look at the, the time. So the man that Jesus Christ is talking about was walking on what is called the bloody way. The bloody way. Oh, there's a good choice. Right, you're going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Let's see, do I take I-95 or should I take the bloody way? Right, this guy takes the, the bloody way. And, and it was called the bloody way because so many people were robbed and, get this, murdered. That's why it was called the Bloody Way. They were murdered on this stretch. And based on the story that Jesus kind of tells, it seems like it was night. And per the story, the, the rocket scientist in this that's traveling the Bloody Way decided to do it at night and he decided to do it alone. Really? Do you have people like this in your life? Like you're gonna make all these bad, bad decisions and then come crying to me? Yeah. All right, bad decisions. I mean, if you look at all of that, we can say, okay, at bare minimal, this guy was probably not very smart, or he was looking for it. Uh, okay. He's an idiot. Why would you walk on the bloody way at night alone? I mean, you're just asking for it. He brought it on himself. He made his own bed. Don't come to me and tell me. He has only himself to blame for this. Oh, let me get biblical on you. That's right, I'm a pastor, I forgot. You will reap what you sow. What you plant, you will get back. 
Yeah. We could say all sorts of stuff like that. The stuff that we tend to say when, you know, we don't want to get involved or we don't want to help. But we do have to be discerning in our own lives. I mean, we can't help everyone, right? If you walk into a stadium full of people, if you go into Dolphin Stadium, right, or Mile High Stadium, and you're looking at all of those people, you can't say, I'm going to help everyone. You are all my neighbors. I love you. You can't do that. You have to be discerning. But we can help anyone. More on that in future weeks. You see, somehow God puts these people in our path and we have this discernment process to determine whether or not they are our neighbor. And a lot of that comes from that spiritual connection, right? That thing that you feel when you, when you meet someone, you're like, yeah, I think I love them. Yeah, I think I get a really good feeling. That lady's smile just lights up my day. And others, you're like, woo, not so much. There's a discerning process, and God gave you a brain, so, you know, let's use it. But does God call us to love even the undeserved? Even the ones who, who brought the trouble on themselves, even the one that travels the bloody path, even those people you have in your life where you go, don't do that, don't date him, don't spend that, don't go there, don't take that job, why are you doing this? No, no, no. Does he call us? The answer is obviously, absolutely yes. Yes. And aren't you glad? <laughs> aren't you glad that God does not require an IQ test to help people? <sighs> Take it from someone that can't get through standardized testing. Or, or an ID or a background check for those people that God helps. Unless, of course, you're perfect. And then none of this applies to you. I, for one, am very happy that the Lord does not require a background check to enter into my life. Because it's messy. And by the way, the disciples, let's pick on those guys, because you go, well, yeah, then all the disciples were perfect, right? Ha! Not! Look at the disciples! They're fishermen! What? This is a motley crew. They're fishermen. They are total pessimists, some of them. There are a couple that are fanatical nationalists. They just want to kill the Romans. These men were rough and tough. There were some of them that were just violent in nature. Oh, yeah, and then there's that guy, you know, Matthew, the tax collector, that betrays his own people, that turns into a thief and a traitor, that is worse than a, a drug dealer that sells drugs to kids these days. That's how low this guy was. A total crazy motley crew. I'm, I mean, Jesus could have walked into any prison and picked out the same set of guys. Wow, I'm glad that the Lord is gracious to the undeserved. And he extends mercy to the wise and to the foolish alike. And so guess what, guys? Just like the Lord, we have to be givers of grace. Even to the people who create their own trouble by their own really bad choices. And even people that are overlooked. In Luke 10, 31 through 32, it says, so likewise, a, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So here is this victim, this guy laying there dying. Beaten, bloody, basically dying, and he gets overlooked by two religious men. I mean, huh. 
I, I thought religious men are supposed to have compassion. Nope, they just, you know, lift up, whoa, look at, whoa, let me just, whoa, lift up these giant robes and let me just go, uh, did you see that? I mean, picture what this scene must have been. I have to tell you, they're probably not evil. In fact, they, they would have been respected leaders of the time. They were probably known for their wisdom and for their compassion. And I feel strongly like if we would have pulled them in a room and sat them down and go, really? What was that? What was the whole robe thing and, and like you didn't see, what was that? I really think that the religious leaders would probably be able to explain that away. I mean, it did kind of make sense. They were probably headed towards their religious duties. And if they touched a corpse, a sinner, they would be excluded from their temple duties. So, we don't, we didn't touch him because then we couldn't serve God. Or maybe they would have said, look, this guy was a total mess. We're religious leaders. We memorize the Torah. But we know nothing about first responding, first aid, CPR. We don't know any of those things. We couldn't help someone in that condition. Or even more so, it could have been a trap. He could have just been laying there looking like a mess, and as soon as we go over to him, because we are the rich, religious, compassionate leaders that we are, he would have gotten up and stolen everything we have. Whatever their reason, reflect on yourself. What are your reasons? Am I a neighbor to people when Others have turned away from them. That's tough. I mean, it's tempting to follow the lead of, of society, right? I mean, if you're a high school or junior high, hey, they're not part of the cool crowd, so that's an easy one. You just write them off. And as adults, we, we look around us and we, and we go, well, if society has shunned them, then, then why should I reach out to them? Why should I follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. Why should I follow the lead of God? Let me follow the lead of that guy with a really cool car. I'll do that, that's, 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 that's a better opportunity. And I mean, it's possible that God may call you to help someone that everyone else has overlooked. It has happened to me. <laughs> Thanks be to God. You may be chosen by God to, to be the conduit for his love and help someone that no one else can help and no one else will help. And by the way, sometimes that is why God has you walking on that path that you do not understand why you are walking on. Sometimes he puts you on that bloody path so you can help someone. He may place it in your heart to help others when others won't. And uh, that even applies to your enemies. Your enemies. In this politically divisive world, pray for them. I mean, this is true all over the world. It makes perfect sense, right? The undeserving, the overlooked. But in order to do that, in order to be an example, in order to be a good neighbor, we have to first be the good news. We have to be living the gospel. We gotta be living it before we can apply it. It's not do what I say, it's do what I do. So before we can share the good news, we need to be the good news. Jesus preached one of the most effective sermons, one of the most memorable ones ever preached in the form of this simple story. Good Samaritan. So who was the good neighbor in that story? 
You know, the thing that your very life here and in eternity depends on. The most important, second greatest commandment of the entire realm of God. Who was the good, mer the good neighbor? The person who had mercy on the man who was beaten. Jesus said, you're right. And he told them, you go and do likewise. Who said Christianity is complicated? Jesus offers you the same salvation. He offers you the same invitation. Will you be a good neighbor to anyone that God brings? Anyone that God brings on your path. Use your discernment process. Anyone. Anyone who needs a loving touch from a grace, gracious and merciful God. With your love, with this Christ-filled life, you can make today a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this worship service. We thank you for this message. And we thank you for the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, I know this message was for so many of us and there's one person in particular that is just resonating with them. And dear Lord, we, we pray that that resonates with absolutely all of us. We want to be a good neighbor. It's tough for us to be a good neighbor sometimes. It's tough for us to listen to the Holy Spirit. But as we do so, we ask that you help us discern anyone that comes in our path that you have put in our path to help to be a neighbor to. Father God, let us help the undeserved. Let us help the overlooked. And let us make it a beautiful day in the neighborhood. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children say, Amen. Man.